Was that always the fashion when you were a student? Was that how you imagined know. yourself? I don't Where know. did Shami at 22 imagine Shami at 46, at 3.40 God. on a Saturday afternoon? <laughs> 3.40 on a Saturday. I, I thought I would be with my dear friend, Andrea Cooper, <laughs> the director of Just... No, look, I, I, not, I had an accidental career. I went into the law like lots of people. I didn't come from a legal family at all. You know, my, my father was a bookkeeper and my late mother was a shop assistant. So there was no... There was no legal tradition or legs up or, you know, people to go and chat to in chambers or firms or anything like that. But there was, you know, Perry Mason and To Kill a Mockingbird and Rumpole of the Bailey. <laughs> right, those are my relatives in the law. <laughs> All right? Um, but, um, but, you know, when I was, I can remember being an undergraduate at the LSE and going to, going to, a, to a talk early one evening for our mutual dear friend Helena Kennedy yep. was giving. Now she doesn't thank me for repeating this story because it <laughs> makes it, her look very old. It makes her look very old because she's quite old, you know. She is. She's <laughs> much older than she's saying. <laughs> Just has turned 60 next year and she keeps on saying publicly, I don't know how many times now, oh I'm not anywhere near as old as Justice. <laughs> oh, that's such a lie. Markedly. Such a lie. No, but, 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 but I remember going to hear her speak and I can remember watching her on TV through my adolescence. She, she presented TV shows that don't get made anymore. There were shows on prime time on the BBC about miscarriages of justice. Yeah. I actually think that your organisation yeah, was part was was involved in the cases and the research that led to, to you know to that kind of programming. And Helena was presenting, and I can remember Helena as if it were yesterday speaking to law students at the LSE <coughs> and. And, and the abiding memory that I have is of Helena saying we need good people with good hearts to go into the law. And this is after you've heard umpteen people telling you about, oh, go and do tax and go and do this and go and do that. Well, fine. That's, a, that's fine. And it's a vocation for some people. You can make a lot of money and have lots of houses. And, all, and give lots of money to justice. And, and give lots of money to justice. <laughs> and it's what you're going to do. It's a perfectly answer. valid thing to be doing with all your millions. Which is fine. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying don't do it, but, I, but I, what I will say is you spend a lot of time at work. Yeah. And if you're a lawyer, if, if you want to make tons of money, there are actually easier ways to do it than the law. <laughs> Even in corporate law or tax law. That, I mean, you can just go and be a banker or a hedge fund or whatever if, you have, if, you, if you've got that inclination. Do that. The law you know, is hard work, both in terms of the study and the practice whatever area of practice you choose. So, <coughs> so, so, so do something that is fulfilling because it's very, very hard to keep absolutely tight boxes mm. between you know, the people you hang out with, the people that you meet and become friends with. It's very hard to completely separate that from, you know, from where you work. So for me, I think I've had a really fortunate accident, accidental mm. career. When people say, Shami, I want to get into human rights law, what do you recommend? I'm like, well, I'm not even completely sure what that means, you know. There's criminal law, there's family law, God help us, there's immigration and asylum law and housing law. There's a, and I tell you what, there's plenty of work. It's not remunerated, but there's plenty of work. So then, as we heard on the last panel, it's, are we for a time going to have to be a little bit entrepreneurial about how to make that work pay are we going to be, you know, fundraisers as well as lawyers, as you know, as well as activists? Um, but not forever, because I believe I believe in legal aid. I believe it as a core tenant of the of, of the post-war settlement, and I think it's worth fighting for. And I think, you know, it, <coughs> it can come back. Now your first job after you qualified as a lawyer. I mean, you, you very soon went on to. I did the office. bar for about bar. five minutes. You know, I'll be honest. <laughs> I mean, you're looking at the sort of failed... I did it for about five minutes. I got off at five o'clock in the morning. I went to possess people's houses one day, and I went to wind companies up in the company. Don't worry, my, my first job, in, I worked for a, in the government practice of a firm called Mutrellis, which is a very Australian law firm. Yeah. And I spent a year acting on behalf of the city of Perth against a group, an NGO called 
and you'll understand what they did, called the People Living with AIDS. Oh, and people living with AIDS had sought town planning approval for a drop-in centre at a local shopping centre. And for a year I represented the city of Perth. And perfectly legitimate, non-discriminative... I mean, it's terrible. And, I, and I've spent the last 20 years trying to redeem myself. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Like, I mean, by the time we won in the High Court, we ended up winning all the way to the High Court of Australia. In the first two hearings, there were men with, like, the three of the applicants had, had oxygen marks on at the back. And then by the full, full bench of the Supreme Court, there are only two of them left. By the end, they're all dead. I was just hor I literally could not You're sleep. You're resolved. <laughs> <laughs> it's like shamming. I'm talking, this is bullshit. I, I worked in the dark tower. I, I, yeah, I, I was in the bar for five minutes, and then I went to work in the home office. Yeah. 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 I was in the bar for five minutes, and then I went to work in the home office. Otherwise known as Mordor. <laughs> <laughs> Abandon all hope, ye who enter here. Are there any government lawyers in the... She's just left. <laughs> <laughs> For real? Yeah. Hetty, she said, don't say the door. Oh, I'm so sorry. She's, fine, she's very lovely. She was a justice in town, so she's come back having gone but, to the Look, I'm not going to... Look, but I had... Look, what I was going to say... <laughs> was, uh, I've said this already. You, you must have learned stuff. It was, the most formative, it was the most formative period in my career. I learned stuff screwing over career. people in the There's no doubt it was the most formative period in my career, and... And that's where I learned about the relationship between law and policy and government and you know legislation and, 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 and how all of that worked and it was completely invaluable. Um, and I and I did that and I got promoted a few times and I did that for nearly six years. Um, but I was never going to be a career Mandarin. You know, it's and, and, and it was you know, there's lots going for it in terms of security and not bad for women and maternity and all of that stuff, but it was never going to be my life. And that's a temperamental thing. That's the other thing. You know, people sometimes talk about career choices as if one is better than another or, or what will be more significant and what will be more influential. Bollocks, <coughs> what will make you fulfilled? Mm. And that's partly a personality and temperamental choice, isn't yeah. it? Well, I can remember when I left the home office, people were telling me, oh, Shami, you're giving up a pension, taking a pay cut, and you know, you'll be far more influential here than you could ever be. Mm -hmm. And you know, I wasn't, I wasn't weighing their stuff. I was actually, you know, choosing um, something vocational, temperamental, an adventure, an experiment. Um, and, and, and that's when I came to, to be a lawyer initially at, at Liberty. And I mean, at that time, Liberty was different to what Liberty is now. Well, I, I hope so. Um, <laughs> Most of you are too young to remember, but Liberty, when Shami took over, I mean, at first as legal director, everyone's too young to remember. Okay, Liberty was, it was a, struggling a bit it was a, yeah, in terms of strategy and funding, and and well, I mean, Liberty that has has not always been what Liberty under Shami's directorship has been. Nor justice. Nor justice, no, obviously. No justice. Um, but but. But so, but it was still an attractive proposition for you. It was the well, you material? Know, it's the challenge, isn't it? It's it's the material. It's the it, it's the injustice and it's the potential and it's. And I'm sure you all feel this. You you must all sometimes just scream at your TV sets when you're listening to, or, or, or perhaps when you're reading about government ministers or others castigating, you know. Um, ambulance chasing legal aid lawyer you've come on all this all this crap about lead a you know for example all this absolute vile and it's really interesting to be talking about this stuff with andrew because of course she's got this international perspective on you know because you've done your work yeah. around the world and you know it used to be despots in in the developing world that go for the lawyers. That's true. You know, play the lawyers rather than the client. You know, and now in modern Britain, you've got you know, you've got cabinet ministers and prime ministers who've done PPE at Oxford. Who think it? Who think it's legitimate? I'm not even making a party political point because over the last decade or more, they've done it on both sides. Yeah. They've slagged off the lawyers, legal aid, the judges. Right? They're not independent judges, my friends. They are, they are unelected judges. Mm -hmm. Now, you're very young, but when I was young, it used to be the hard left mm -hmm. that would say, come the revolution, we'll elect the judges. You, you, you know, the, the idea of a conservative prime minister yeah, like Mr Cameron criticising judges for being unelected, that's, and that is something I think 
it's worth considering because you are lawyers, most of you, at the beginning of your journey. And I don't think it's enough anymore to go, we're entering a profession that will always be there, that will always be protected, will always be independent. You know, a lot has been done to erode respect for the profession, for the judiciary, and the rule of law itself. And I think that that is going to have to be hard fought for again. Um, otherwise, otherwise I, 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 really, I really fear for the future. And so around this time that you joined Liberty, the Human Rights Act had just come into force that was shortly before, a year before, 13 months before. Yeah, I mean, the, the human, I mean, this is part of the tragedy. What do you remember about that? What I remember is, you know, the Human Rights Act we know was passed in 98, but, but of course it wasn't brought into force until 2000. And this is really part, this is quite a crucial part of the story that people sometimes forget. Now, why two years to bring a bill into, uh, to, to, to bring an act into force? Two years after all of a sudden, that's, you know, why? Because the government already had cold feet. Yeah, by the morse. Right? So, um, so you've got this optimistic new Labour government, a uh, new Labour opposition that wants to be, that wants to be liberal but economically and socially, and that initially thought it would have to be in coalition with the Lib Dems, etc. You know, the politics is, is out there, you can, you can read about it. Then they get a landslide, and great, they're committed to the human rights side, but as soon as they are in power, they're getting advice from officials. I was an official, and the advice was, oh, this could be really dangerous stuff. And you said you're going to be tough on crime, and you said you're going to be tough, tough on immigration and asylum and all of this stuff, but you've also said you're going to be a constitutionally reforming government with devolution and freedom of information and human rights act and, and so on. And there is a tension here. Now, when you're in opposition, you can say what you like. It's like being an activist. You can, you, can, you can say what you like. But when you're actually sitting there in Whitehall with all of this advice, there are people telling you that these things are interconnected. So the, so the, so the Blair government had cold feet about the Human Rights Act right from the beginning. Yeah. But it passed with cross-party support, including a wonderful maiden speech from, from our friend Dominic yeah. Grieve, who I know you, I think you heard from this morning, who, who's, a, who's a wonderful hero in this, in this story, actually. A lawyer first, politician second, really important. Um, but so, so we've got two years before the act comes into force, and, and part, part of the reasoning was that the new Labour government wanted to educate judges. There was this big yeah. programme of, of educating judges, training judges in human Justice rights. Justice made a fortune now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in, order, in order for them not to be too radical. Yeah. They need to be trained, you know, in, in proportionality and deference. You know that old chestnut? Mm -hmm. Deference. I think if, if there is such a thing as deference as a legitimate concept, it ought to be a two-way street. Yeah. Know? A little bit of constitutional humility on both sides. But anyway, so two years before it comes into force. So now it's already October 2000. And then, of course, crucially, it's only 11 months later that we get the 9-11 that I join Liberty. And that's when things go seriously wrong. And I want you not to be afraid, because you've been sitting here safely all day. No bombs have gone off. Nothing bad has happened. But I'm now in the room, so... so most dangerous woman in Britain. I used to be the most dangerous <laughs> woman in Britain, but not anymore. It's Nicola Sturgeon now. <laughs> um, she's younger than me as well. <laughs> I don't believe that for a second. Um, no, she is younger than me. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, I, I, I understand she's also think slightly that. taller. Um, she wears, she wears, she, wears, she does, yeah. makes more of an effort than the street front. Um, so, so the day after you join Liberty, yeah. the Twin Towers come down, yeah. what, does, what, what does your day then turn into? Oh, we're doing the day thing, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah. Like, what, was your, what was your day like? Okay. What was your day like? It was very strange because I, yeah, the, the day before was my first day. I walked into this completely crappy, ramshackle building off the Borough High Street and thought, hmm. right? You gave up your pension, your park view, your nice office for a bit. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't just kind of ramshackle, it was like, it was like... It was just absolutely yeah. terrible, that building. Yeah, if everybody's actually been to Liberty now, Liberty now is very <coughs> organised, very tidy, very neat. You used to go to Liberty yeah. off Borough High Street. It was not good. I, I grew up in a council estate. There was still <laughs> more chip boards and 
Which chip it's wallpaper terrible. falling off the slightly it damp walls bad. at Liberty on Borough High Street than there was in the I entire think people thought it was cool. I, I just think some people thought that was... This is kind of an important But that's the that NGO chic thing. That so. kind of shabby chic <laughs> thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Good. Every, t- every time Channel 4 does a documentary and there are NGOs, yeah, there yeah. are people wearing marijuana leaf t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and there's a picture, there's a Universal Declaration of Human Rights on the wall and a couple of, like, the organisation I used to be, International Human Rights Education, and there'd always be some really crappy kind of wooden clock from West Africa or something <laughs> that you couldn't ever give away because some some partner had given it to you. Do you know what? It's bourgeois it bullshit awful. because yeah. you ask any, you know, because our clients more than anybody deserve to go into a proper legal office and feel that they're being treated professionally yeah. by somebody who's wearing a suit or whatever it is, actually. True. And I can remember when I was in bar school, you know, some of the kids that were dressed so ridiculously smartly for bar school were actually the you know the more working class kids. So this idea that it's cool to be shabby and a bit chaotic and borderline unprofessional, I yeah. think I'm not really cool with that at all actually. Because as I say, the most vulnerable people deserve the no, best too. representation and protection and and a sense that and a sense that they are worth something. Because that's the beginning of it, and that's what we do hopefully as lawyers as lawyers for the. Vulnerable. So yeah, that was a big mess, and um, it took a few years. But at least now, an office um, in Westminster. And it's not. It's not grand. It isn't grand, but it's a. It's a building to be proud of. I think that's. I, I think that's well represents. I think that's important. You know, yeah. look, human rights are ultimately about human beings, right? Human rights to me. We can talk about them in legal terms, and we're all lawyers here, and that's important. We can enumerate them and talk about where they sit in the rule of law uh, and what they are, and we can do that. But to, but to articulate them for lay people, including clients, but also the people that we're trying to speak to in the policy and in the media, we've got to, we've got to be clear that human rights are about protecting and, and celebrating everything that it is to be a human, human being. Yeah. And not just to survive but to thrive as a human being. I, you know, and so I think we can start with you know, a, decent, a decent work environment for our colleagues, a decent um, professional attitude to each other and to our clients, and then blend it with the passion and the activism and the, yeah. and the values. So September 10, Shabby Chic, Borough High Street. Yeah. So, and I, was, I, I was given this, this is, a, this is an NGO trick, by the way, be careful. So when there's no money to pay you, they give, uh, you, a grand they give you a grand title. It's true. <laughs> I've done it myself, right? So I was given this grand title of in-house counsel. You'd think I was going to work for RBS. Or <laughs> and the board of Liberty at that time were really concerned that we weren't strategic enough. Now, re- remember, you know, NGOs are not supposed to be law firms or law centres. They're supposed to have a strategy. Yeah. Because it lets, and, it, and I think that kind of stuff is even more important now probably than it was then. Because with the obliteration of legal aid, there is an ocean of unmet need out there. And so, and that cannot ever be, you know, legal aid cannot be replicated by, um, by NGOs. NGOs have to be part of the political <coughs> movement to rebuild it in the future. But in the meantime, what's the strategy? And the Board of Liberty at the time back in back in 2001 were really worried about a lack of strategy so they appointed me as in-house counsel to to think about strategic litigation and how to use litigation not just let's do a case that we're interested in because it will get us to the court of appeal because it's an interesting point yeah about donor insemination or 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 fox hunting or or fox hunting or whatever it is but what is the strategy for using the law to achieve things for human rights in the country and so, um, so I was supposed to do blue sky thinking. So you did that for a day. And I a did half. that for less than a day, and then the twin towers happened. And then you knew you weren't going to, you know, forget no more blue skies, let alone blue sky thinking. So then it's about um, getting ahead of the get about knowing what the government's going to do. And I have to say, um, it, it was kind of chilling how predictable the Home Office reaction was. So I knew there would be internments, yeah. and I knew that immigration law would be the tool to do it, because it was so obvious, because immigration law uh, as, a, as, a, as a branch of administrative law was already the way, and it still is by the way, the way that you can detain people 
for long stroke indefinite periods without proper due process. So of course if you want to... So the Home Office insight immediately... Becomes. Immediately kicked in. And you know, and then the attacks on privacy. ID cards have been around on the shelf for some time. Um, what I didn't predict, if I'm absolutely honest, which what I never would have predicted, were, um, were the experiments in torture. Yeah. That I did not predict. And to this day I'm shocked. Mm. I'm not shocked by many things, but that, you know, that the extraordinary rendition piece, the torture techniques in detention in Iraq and, and so on, again, exposed by a combination of, you know, public interest lawyers, including in private practice, and investigative journalism, that I, that I did not predict, and that was the I mean, I guess for, for those who are more new to the jurisprudence, I mean, in the late 90s and early in 2000, the jurisprudence was internationally was moving towards expanding definitions of what torture mm. was. So all of a sudden, you know, in human degrading treatment, it become, becomes expanded, the Salmoni case against France or whatever. Mm. And so we had these visions, and I just finished my master's when the Twin Towers came down, and we had these visions of, you know, where's torture protection going to go next? Mm. And you never would have thought that within six months, it, it, you'd be going backwards so quickly and just having to hold back the, the wall from, from kind of flooding over. Yeah. Um, it did I, just completely you know, like, change everything. It's completely predictable, but I'm always thinking about the relationship between the law and politics and the policy. And, I, I, and power. And power. And, and my view is that, as with all of these terrible human rights abuses, but more than any of them, this is partly why we have ISIS today. Because yep. we've once you lose your moral authority, even a bit, it's not about, I'm not saying... There's a moral equivalence here, but the moment as a great democracy or as great democratic alliances, you compromise on things yeah, like torture, it's almost game over in any kind of propaganda um, piece. And we're still, we're still to recover from that, I think. Yeah. And I mean, looking back, we'll open it up for questions in a few minutes, but looking back over your time, obviously you're coming to your end of your time at Liberty. And, um, what is what are sort of the few things that you're most proud of in that time? I mean, what do you look back and think? Job well done, Shami, or Liberty? Because it's never just you. Well, no, it's never, no, 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 no. And, no, no. And to be clear, it was never just Liberty either. Yeah. It was all about. It's, at the end of the day, it's twenty odd staff and a couple of million quid a year, and, a ni and now a nicer office, but you know, and and whatever, eleven thousand members. But nothing was ever won without building different coalitions yeah. and alliances and. And justice was part of many of those. So let's be let's be absolutely clear about that. But I think that in terms of parliamentary victories, probably you know the big set piece victories on um, <coughs> detention without charge, ninety days and then forty two days. They were really important. They were important in themselves, but they were important because they became symbolic and, and iconic about we will defend civil liberties. And I think they became important in the world. So there was, you know, there were, there were, you know, they were looked at around the world as we're, we're stopping, we're drawing the line here. And then I think, so that's in Parliament. I think uh, in terms of litigation, I think that, um, I think in the Court of Human Rights, some really important stuff on DNA yeah. retention, yes, on stop and search without suspicion. When people are slagging off the, the, the Strasbourg courts, let's, you know, let's remember the Article 8 Piece on which our domestic courts were not always so vigilant. But sometimes I think it does take an international court, including judges who've been in countries that have not been democracies for that long, to understand the importance of a qualified right like Article 8 and what happens when you start compromising on privacy. Yeah. You know? So I think that, on the litigation, you know, that that was um, incredibly important. I think in terms of broader media and civil society, just just pushing back and putting this stuff on the agenda, and, and, and hopefully not just for lawyers, yeah. but for but for lay people and journalists and, and um, you know in all those other spaces. And I think that you know that's you know sometimes the that's sometimes the liberty that ought to, to some extent be the the liberty justice partnership that you know liberty needs to sort of get out on the picket line and you know and, and, sure. and not just be you know I think I think we, we need lawyers we need campaigning lawyers but we also need journalists school teachers trade unionists and, 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 and that can be a human rights movement 
yeah. not just a particular NGO, but a movement that we can we can all be proud of. And and obviously we face we've both been around long enough to have seen the Human Rights Act under threat before. Yeah. But we now face a manifesto commitment yes. from the party of government. Yes. What, when, how do you see that playing out? Okay, so, um, so it's clear to me that, um, and it's been clear to me for some time, and it's not just a theory, it is, um, it is intelligent, it's hard intelligence, not even soft intelligence, um, that, that David Cameron's view was that he, wanted, he always wanted to stay in the EU, um, but he wanted to throw red meat to Eurosceptics. And the red meat is called human rights. Um, and he was prepared to play fast and loose with people's, um, with people's understanding of and cherishing of the ECHR and the HRA as a price worth paying to stay in the EU. And the danger of that, of course, is you, you end up with an EU... We end up with an EU for money and markets and an EU that's going to send gunboats to stop refugees... Right? Now, whatever your views on Brexit, <coughs> that's not the EU that I'm going to fight for. So I'm an internationalist, and I think globalisation is not a choice, it's a reality, and to some extent you and I are both products of it. We are. We, you know, it's all been crisscrossing around the globe, but we are both kind of products of, of empire and post-empire. Yeah. <coughs> so globalisation, internationalism in the modern world is a reality, not a choice, but the question is, who does it work for? Is it just going to be for money and markets and the super rich? Or is it going to be for human rights too? Yeah. Yeah. I talk too much. Thank you so much. Sorry. <laughs> Not at all. So, um, so that's, that was David Cameron's strategy. It was David Cameron's strategy before 2010, let alone before, uh, thank you, before um, 2015. And so just keep throwing the red meat. So I'm going to be for the EU, but going to be anti-ECHR and anti-HRA. Now, that's the bad news. That, that is the evil genius plan. The good news is that a majority of 12 is not a big majority. I'm old enough to remember John Major as a Conservative Prime Minister virtually slashing his wrists with a majority of more than that. And the good news is there are pro ECHR, pro-HRA conservatives in both camps, in both the EU camp, the, the Remain camp and the Leave camp. So there are people who have differentiated between the two. That's important. Yeah. The good news, of course, is also devolution yep. and the very active support from Nicholas Sturgeon from the Republic of Ireland, which is signatory to the Good Friday Agreement. There are all sorts of ways in which to mess with the HRA is to really mess with the UK in terms of its delicate, um, very fragile um, constitutional settlement. Constitutional settlement. Um, and the good news is that, you know, for all its current issues, the Labour Party is in a better place on, yeah, on human rights. You know, whatever your views are on Jeremy Corbyn, his voting record, I would argue, mm -hmm on the stuff that I work towards in my adult life is pretty much <coughs> perfect. And the old Labour, new Labour, whatever you want to call them, camps within that party have found it um, easy to unite around this yeah. issue. So my view is, no time for complacency, but completely all to play for, and it's not the time for, for lawyers to keep their heads down. Let's open it up to the floor. Um, this man's very quick. <laughs> Haven't even. I've only just over the floor. Um, we'll, take, so we'll take a couple of questions. Just say two because we don't, we're not going to write anything down. So we'll take you, sir, and then you in the other corner. Um, we saw in 2001 with the Belmarsh case, uh, Labour government having brought the Human Rights Act in, then having very quickly to try and row back on the commitments they brought in with it. Do you think that if the Twin Towers had come down three or four years earlier? the Human Rights Act would have happened at all, either at when it did, or perhaps even in the years that followed, might we not have ever got the Human Rights Act? 
That's a really interesting thought experiment. Um, can we stop for one second? We'll take this question yeah. as well. And then Depends what you're plugging, Ollie. I'm plugging the legal aid lawyers, so hopefully that's okay. It's alright. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'd like to just thank Shami for what she said and say that young legal aid lawyers have brutal campaigns for access to justice and the interests of junior lawyers who work or aspire to work in the legal aid sector. I've got some information outside, by where we're having coffee, and a sign up sheet as well for young legal aid lawyers. Um, I met with the Minister for Legal Aid two days ago, and I think it's safe to say that the current government is unlikely to do anything to improve the situation hugely over the next few years. But I'd like to ask Shami, I suppose, what we can all do as campaigners and lawyers to improve access to justice and legal aid and protect it, as well as protecting our human rights, because without access to those through legal aid, through funding for cases, having the rights for themselves is almost meaningless if people can't enforce them in court. So I'd say, what can we all do to improve things? Okay, so we've got a really... Um philosophical, historical question over here and then a really hard, tack, practical, activist question over there. Great combination. Um, to, to, to answer you first, um, would we have got... No, I don't... Look, I, Belmarsh or no Belmarsh, I don't believe <coughs> that New Labour would have um, enacted the Human Rights Act as second-term business or even a bit later in its first term, because of for the reasons I set out, and you're right, Belmont, you know, 9-11, uh, you know, is, 9-11 was not the whole story, by the way. The authoritarianism of that, of that um, faction, of, of Blair and Brown and so on, didn't begin with 9-11, in my view. If you look back at things like ASVOs, and, mm. you know, there, there's lots of denigration of due process, and, and not just of due process, but of, of unworthy people. You know, the divide and rule. It goes on throughout history and all over the world, divide and rule. You know, foreigners, our people, asylum seekers, our people, and then even on a council estate we will we will have the worthy poor and the unworthy poor, and that's the whole ASBO thing. And that was beginning even before nine eleven. But I think I think you've got something there. I think that we were very lucky that the Human Rights Act was passed as early business, manifesto commitment. And I think it's quite possible that if the, you know, if it if it'd been delayed, post uh, into into the second term, frankly, it wouldn't have happened. And, and you're quite right that obviously, 9/11 became the great excuse for exceptionalism. It's a, it's, it's a sort of positive spin on a depressing story, which is thank God we got it when we did. But it's as though there's such a tiny window which could have actually yeah. happened. Before. And it was so important, wasn't it? Because we couldn't have got. The, I can remember sitting with Gareth Pierce and with Steve Gross and all these other, you know, amazing legal aid lawyers. Um, Nick Blake, I remember sitting with all of them, some of them are barristers and some of them are solicitors, and I was showing them the Belmarsh legislation in draft. It hadn't got through Parliament yet. And I was meeting with them because they were the litigators who we were going to have, who we were going to get the clients and who we were going to have to do this. And they could not believe, even Gareth Pierce who'd done the Troubles, who'd done the Guildford Four. And the, she, she wasn't an immigration lawyer by background, you see. She'd come through the criminal track, even anti-terror law, which had been exceptional in the 70s and the 80s and whatever, hadn't gone as far as this. Um, and, and I can remember the horror on her face when she first, when she first looked at it. So, so yeah, that kind of <coughs> moment for exceptionalism. And then it became, and then look what happened, you know. You, you know it, Things that were that are exceptional and, and okay become permanent, and they become spread to to you know to to the whole population and not not just the foreigners, as with control orders. But remember, a control order has its genesis legally and philosophically in an ASBO. It's an anti-terror ASBO. It's a combination of the secrecy of Belmarsh and special advocates and all of that with the ASBO. It's a mutant hybrid between between what? Between civil and administrative and, and criminal um, process. <coughs> um, and then this this you know from the young legal aid lawyers. You're a, it's a fantastic group, and you um, your your group had a Liberty Human Rights Award a few years ago, and have done wonderful work and will continue to. I I think there's a twin track here, because so I'm I'm afraid I rather agree with you that. Um, um, that the present 
government, and that's under Cameron or his um, successor, probably Boris Johnson. <coughs> you know, um, I don't think there's going to be a turnaround um, in, for, for the better in legal aid before 2020. So between now and 2020, I th and I'm sorry that's really depressing because when you're young, that seems like a long time. At my age, that seems like a less long time. Um, I will turn this around and make it positive, I promise. But I can just see the faces. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm like, oh, it'll be, there's a pre-2020 strategy and there's a post-2020 strategy. I'm looking at these young faces going, what? <laughs> <laughs> wait till 2020. No, but realistically, there is not going to be the shift that we want in government policy before there is a new government. Because it's ideological. Right, austerity isn't just a pragmatic thing, it's ideological. Mm -hmm. And that's austerity as a general economic proposition. If you're looking at legal aid, that is ideological too. And it's spiteful. And, it is, and, and, compare, and, and you need to look at the attacks on legal aid, in my view, alongside <coughs> the attacks on trade union freedom and the latest stuff on civil society. Mm. So charities that get government funding and have to sign no advocacy clauses. Right? This is a government that does not believe in checks and balances and charity screens. So you are not going to get a turnaround in legal aid on behalf of the most vulnerable until at least 2020. So I think there's a short-term strategy, which is about um, activism and campaigning, but also about test case litigation in cases where legal aid is refused, using Article 6, etc., etc., etc. There's going to have to be um, fundraising strategy, there's going to have to be philanthropy and insurance and crowdsourcing and whatever it is, and we were hearing a little about that yeah. in the previous session, to get key cases off the ground. But sadly, that's not going to deal with the ocean of unmet need. That is going to be the test cases that will hopefully then benefit other people. It's heartbreaking, but that's what I've had to do for, for all my for my 14 years at Liberty. And, and, and all of that piece, and making lots of noise and telling lots of stories about this about this unmet need and what it's doing for people, so that it becomes it becomes a, a genuine story of poor people being abused and not the story that it's been for too long which is lawyers bleating about not and, and forgive me but neither the law society nor the bar council has ha really made a good um, a good fist of campaigning for le legal aid even in better no, times too much and then post and then and then the other part of this is working on the labor party and on you know and on parts of the Tory party who aren't currently in the ascendancy and whoever else in the political community to make sure that there is a post-2020 strategy. And that may mean a lot of work, actually. That may mean, because we probably never go back to what we had, so what should we be aiming for? You know, what is... What is, and this is very justice, actually. Well, we've been doing lots of work around the what's now become Michael Briggs's online court and how to have a, parts of civil justice taken online so that people who are unrepresented don't have to actually have a lawyer necessarily to be able to negotiate their way through simple procedures. Hopefully then saving money that can then be put into supporting really vulnerable people. But the, the, the other challenge is rises in bloody court fees. I mean, which just, the latest budget... So now divorce becomes, you know, just when you, uh, you know, need to get divorced, you're now going to be paying 45% more. Do you know, I noticed today, I noticed, <coughs> I noticed that obviously Ian Duncan Smith has been mm -hmm. replaced by a man called Stephen Crabb. Yeah. He's a next generation kind of conservative um, politician. He, he's from Wales and whatever. And I was reading the news coverage of his appointment and he, he says himself that he came from a troubled family and once came between his father and his mother and there was a knife and he was as a young boy. You know. And we need to just be working, we just need to, and he's now replaced Ian Duncan Smith and so he's going to be acting benefits or whatever. Mm. But nonetheless I think, you know, this is politics and this is lobbying. We need to be, I'll tell you what, when the expenses scandal happened there were so many MPs from across the piece who were phoning me and wanting help because they couldn't rep they were worried about representing themselves before the various parliamentary tribunals that they had to go to. So so believe you me, they all want a lawyer 
They all want a lawyer when they when they need one. But we need, I said, the short term doing what we can strategy, and then there has to be a really serious um, strategy, not post-2020, it has to be ready for the 2020 election, election. which is, here is our movement's program for what a modern legal aid system looks like. <coughs> a couple of questions. Uh, this lady's gentleman back. Hi, um, <coughs> in the UK, rider calls are people who um, have Well, here's, here's the thing. I'm not convinced that the narrative is so accepted. If you read the Times and the Mail and listen to the big political editors and correspondents, even in broadcast media, you would think that this narrative is accepted. But if you do as I do and spend your time on the trains, travelling the length and breadth of the country, speaking in rooms like this, but to very different audiences, not just legal audiences, to old, you know, to, to anybody who wants to come to a public meeting about human rights. The narrative is not so accepted. At the end of the day, that election was a landslide. I mean, this man, you know, got more than the other candidates all put together. You know, in the Labour Party, and he didn't recruit those people. You know, there was a there was a time bar on on voting, and of course, the membership has increased since. And so, I'm I'm just not prepared to. I my rule of thumb is that I'm not clever, and everybody else is stupid. If I've got a good idea, the chances are, if it's a really good idea, the chances are that there are some other people who agree with me. Um, <coughs> And if nobody agrees with me, maybe it's not such a good idea, or maybe I'm not communicating it well. So I don't, I don't actually share the, the council of, of, of despair. I think in the political elite, and the, and, and the political elite of this country is about my age. So it's back to that middle to, middle to late 40s <laughs> columns, right? But they, no, they are. I mean, you know, someone like Ed Miliband's about six months younger than me. Yvette Cooper and Ed Balls are about the same age. David Cameron and Nick Clegg are a few years older. So I, I am that sort of age group. And there are a lot of people who are like, oh, my God, what, what are we doing? We're, we're not yet 50 and we've had our chance. We've blown it. And, and they are represented in the media as well. And they're like, whoa, we're not... We're not on top of this. We, we suddenly don't have speed dial to the leader of the opposition. or to, to, to sort of, And so you're seeing that flailing around, but I'm not convinced that that's actually reflected um, across the country. What I do think is it's a very divided country. I mean, look at the whole Scotland. Our country, the United Kingdom, is not a United Kingdom. It is very, very divided. But I don't buy this idea that... Um, you know, that Jeremy Corbyn, what happened with Jeremy Corbyn is just a little storm in a teacup, and that the received wisdom across the land is that, you know, it should have been, a, it should have been this Kendall. I mean, I am a feminist, but my feminism has its limits. <laughs> <laughs> this gentleman. Oh, yeah, that kind of runs on from the kind of social and cultural aspects of it. Is it. Why is there almost total silence about the economic, social, and cultural rights when we talk about human rights? Yeah. They are the other side of it, which unlocks Absolutely. all of the others. Absolutely. But we concentrate on sexy ones, and we don't deal with how we actually yeah. pay for it. I think it's a, I think it's a historical, it's kind of historical, cultural, political thing in this country, and it's. It uh, and again, Andrew is really good on this because she's worked, she, you know, she's done human rights work around the globe, which I haven't done, so she's probably better placed to put this in the broader context. My own view, for what it's worth, because I, I was born and brought up, and I've always worked in the UK. My view is that what, ha what proposition number one, human rights are for human beings and everything that they need. And human rights need the whole piece. So we need the shelter and the water and the food and the education and the culture and all of that as well as the free speech and the fair trials and the personal privacy. And I'm so, so and I've for years had people have a go at me about one one is more important than the other and blah 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 and it's just such bollocks, isn't it? And I just say, look, 
You know, Eleanor Roosevelt famously said, human rights begin in small places close to home. So let's take it to the home, right? If, I, if, I'm, if you're having um, a weekend guest in your home, or an overnight guest in your home with your family, you don't say to your guest, well, here's the choice. You can have dinner with my family, <laughs> and you can eat what you like, and you can share what we have, and, um, um, but you can't speak. <laughs> and you can go to the nice guest room that we prepared for you, but the door will have to stay open all night, including the loo, when you go to the loo, and there'll be a camera there. And all that. So you can have the room and the bed and the food, but you can't speak it. It's bollocks, right? Because, you're, because <coughs> respecting your guest or respecting your family member is about everything that they need to... Right? And that's true in society as well as in the family. So we know that we need civil and political and social and economic rights. It just so happens that in the UK, with its particular <coughs> um, political history, post-World War II, which is really the important period as far as I'm concerned, Magna Carta, really? <laughs> I'm sorry, but I'm really sorry. You know, I've just had that up to, you know, now, representation of the People Act, that'll be 100 years in two years. Now, that is an anniversary I'm prepared to get involved with. But Magna Carta, do me a favour. Right, so, so it's the, it's the post-World War II period that is the crucial human rights period as far as I'm yep. concerned. And in Britain, the socio-economic piece was delivered um, by the welfare state, by the NHS, by state education, and by politics. Do you see what I mean? And then the human rights piece actually lagged behind a little bit and we've got it piecemeal with, you know, sex discrimination and race, race relations and ultimately the, the human rights. And we have the ECHR. And, and to be honest, there is an argument that some things are better delivered in courts and some things are better delivered in politics. But in South Africa, they have the whole experiment with, with adjudication on social and economic <coughs> rights. And, you know, we've, we've been having court cases about the bedroom tax and we're having, you know, mm. so... so you know, of course we need, of course we need it all, and then the question is the delivery, the delivery mechanism, and which delivery mechanism a particular uh, polity and culture chooses will sometimes be, um, will be accidents of history. I mean, I think we are in a, a difficult time at the moment, though, because there are some who say, with the British Bill of Rights coming, it's a great opportunity now for us to get in the right to shelter. I mean, the number really? Of, oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, our event at the Liberal Democrats conference last year was pretty depressing with certain peers saying, but Andrew will be able to get the right to education in the British Bill of Rights. I mean, I think we have to pick our moment to start pushing. Oh, yeah. um, and this is not the moment. So, I mean, this is batten down the hatches and protect what I we've mean, got. We, we talked about this at Justice. There's a real risk in this narrative around the British Bill of Rights. We've been talking about it all day, all day from Dominic to the sessions you had with the staff. Let's be realistic. We'd all love to have a genuine debate about Bill of Rights, about a constitution that protects us all and protects all of the panoply of international rights that we all believe in. But that's not what we're having. <laughs> we're talking about fewer rights for fewer people. And politically, the government would love you to believe that this is a moment for that constitutional conversation. They want you to buy their conversation that this is about a shopping list, that they're offering you the world. Because the minute you legitimise that conversation by saying, yeah. yeah, let's have that debate, they'll say, well, we have the debate. And actually, it is about fewer rights for fewer people. <laughs> um, don't buy it. Yeah. Don't buy it. And there's a danger, as lawyers, if I may say so, you know, having, um, having been... Having had a foot in both camps, you know, having been a lawyer and then a bit of a mandarin and then an activist, you know, um, I'm sort of in recovery or sometimes in... Re no, you never recover. I've been in remission periodically <laughs> as a lawyer. Okay. And there is a danger that as lawyers we think we could draft the perfect Bill of Rights. Well, of course we could. You know how they used, they used to be an expression that every corporal has a field marshal's baton in his knapsack? Well, every lawyer has the constitutional draftsman's pen. But this is not a drafting problem. This is a political problem. This is, a, this, this is the most authoritarian political class, left and right, that we've seen probably in, in a hundred or more years. And this particular government has no interest whatsoever in Human Rights Act Plus. It's about 
nothing against the MOD, nothing for foreigners, nothing for bad people, nothing in trivial cases. What are trivial human rights violations? I think Rosa Parks should have just got over herself and gone to the back of the bus. That's no, no. <laughs> pretty trivial. Get over yourself. You know, so, so it's a political issue. It's not a drafting issue or a jurisprudential issue. And these people want to take our rights away, and not even our rights, the rights of our clients who are you know, some of the most vulnerable people in this country. Can we have a, one more question? You can grab Shami afterwards. Somebody else? Last question. Lady at the back. Hi, I'd like to ask Shami about the highlights of the career and the reasons behind leaving Liberty. So, the highlights of my career. And why are you leaving Liberty? Well, this is clearly the highlight of my career. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I, look um, why am I leaving Liberty? Because. You've been there too long. I've been there too long. Because I'll it's, it's too look, it's too long to run a to run a, a, a country, a dictatorship, a democracy, whatever, and it's and it's it's just too it, it's just too long for for me and for the organisation. You've got to you know you've just got to you know to have that that view. I think you know it, I think I've pushed the outer limit of what is a, a, a reasonable period of time to, to do it and keep doing it well, and and it's really bad for for a person to become too closely personally associated with an organisation. Now, now bigger NGOs, your Amnesties, your Oxfams, etc., they can have um, they can spend money on branding and cinema ads and whatever, but with the smaller NGOs the the director is the, the principal spokesperson becomes like a human logo and you just become too with the best will in the world, you become too personally identified with the cause. And so if you want to rebrand, you change the human logo. And I've, I've, you know, I've always believed that. And the problem is I love the work, and there's always a reason to stay, but you've just got to go, no, you've, done, you've made your contribution, it's time for someone else. Frankly, you know, there will be people who are just irritated by my voice. I know it's hard to believe. <laughs> <laughs> but there'll be some people who are potentially interested could be potentially persuaded, not that bloody woman again, you know. So let them hear the message in a different way from somebody with different stories and different perspectives, maybe a younger person, maybe someone more of the internet age, you know, someone who, you know, isn't mocked by their by their teenage son for not being able to use Spotify properly or whatever, <laughs> you know. Um, I think that's really, really important because this is not a cult. <coughs> This is this is a movement that we that we all want to be part of. And the woman deserves a break. I mean, the woman deserves, deserves a break. Really? There was, yeah, there was talk of a drink. There is a drink. Um, I think we'll leave it on with that. Um, our enormous thanks to you, Shami. We love you. Um, Shami's going to do when she leaves Liberty and you know isn't it sad and terrible and I keep on reminding people that she's not going to be put down no. uh, she's not being executed no. um, I don't think this is the last you'll ever hear of her um, and uh, and you really are uh, approaching national treasure although you're not quite old enough so um, I would like to extend our thanks to all of the people who've participated in today on the panels uh, Dominic, obviously, this morning, particularly to Paul for stepping in uh, for our Jodie Blackstock, who couldn't be with us. Um, our thanks to the University of Law, uh, to all of you. The next student event will be a conversation with another friend of Shami's and mine, Karen Monaghan QC from Matrix. Um, and that will be held at Linklaters in a couple of months' time, so we'll send you a note about that. But she's a pretty inspiring uh, woman on every metric. Um, but she's a person who, who didn't do her A-levels, for example, um, that's kind of unlikely to happen these days in the law, um, but really is a fa one of our fabulous public law barristers. Um, so we look forward to seeing you then. Thank you all for giving up your Saturday, um, and please keep up the good fight on the Human Rights Act. Um, with everybody you speak to, tell them that it's important. Convince your grandmother, your cousins, <laughs> your builders, whoever is in your house, um, and, uh, and anybody you sit next to on the bus. Our thanks. Safe travels home. <laughs>